Welcome, I'm David Nurse, MBA shooting coach turned life optimization coach, speaker, author, leader of all types. On this show, we bring on high performers, athletes, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people doing amazing things in this world, but they weren't always at that spot. And we talk about how they got through their stuck situation and made their pivot to achieve their success. So join me every week as we pivot and go. I'm dreaming vivid, so I'm living my goals. Written to existence, you know I'm doing the most. I'm steady winning, having breakfast for dinner, cause I'm always giving a toast. I live that 1% of lifestyle, didn't you know? Doing what I can just to get in the zone. Incremental change and help you get in the flow. But if you hit the wall, gotta pivot and go. Switch your perspective and go for the goal. It ain't the end of the road, just pivot and go. Just pivot and go. This week, we're going to get our recovery on with the ultimate recovery tool and company, Hyper Ice. We have on Jim Heather, the CEO of Hyper Ice, and the man behind how they have grown this company to be literally the go-to recovery module for all professional sports, NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, you name it, with some of the top athletes in the world swearing by their product for recovery. What it does is it's many different products that will accelerate your warm-up time. It will help with your cool down, your recovery, your muscle soreness, just your overall longevity and total optimization Hyper Ice. You're going to learn all in depth about that and recovery from Jim Heather on the Pivot and Go podcast. So buckle up. Here we go. Can you just give us a little bit of a background how Hyper Ice came to be? Because you're literally taking over every sport in the recovery aspect of the game. Yeah, it's been fun. And it, it um, I joined in 2014 um, as CEO. So I've been with the company for about seven years. So um, I didn't found the company. Anthony Katz yep. uh, was a former teacher, basketball coach, founded the company. Uh, we work really well together and have since the very beginning when I when we joined forces. Um, but it's been it's been a tremendous ride. We started out uh, not having any electronic products. And one of the things that we aligned on was we want to change this into a consumer electronics company. We want to shift into away from just sporting goods. We want to be a tech focused company. And we had a vision for, you know, how we could change the world through technology and do it through innovation. And we started out in the pro sports space because we knew if we could create credibility there with the leading athletic trainers, the leading sports performance experts, the leading pro athletes in the world, the teams that were putting multiple millions of dollars into protecting their multi-million dollar assets. If we could prove that we could be effective there, we could go to the masses and help everybody on earth move better and live better. Um, so over the last three years, we've had the opportunity to make that transition from just the world of pro sports and sports performance into a dynamic worldwide recovery brand um, with a big mission of helping everybody move better and live better. And it's been a lot of hard work, but it's been incredible and, and quite fun. Oh, yeah. And you guys are you're moving the needle. I remember when you guys first came out, I was like, what is this? And it's it's just yep. really catching on. And, and can you dive into the science behind Hyper Ice? Yep. Like what makes you guys better than everybody else out there? Yeah, great question. And, and first off, I think a, a attention to detail mm. and the sophistication in our product design is something that differentiates us. And it's been a competitive advantage since the very beginning. We actually have aerospace engineers on staff who worked on rocket ships wow. that are developing products uh, in connection to our product development team. So we go a, a great lengths to spend the time and energy making sure that if we're gonna launch a product, it's going to be the best product in the market. It's going to solve a problem. It's going to um, create some new energy in the space. So that's been a, a big part of our innovation pipeline. Uh, but I think as it relates to the science, uh, we, we look at this at four categories right now. We have thermal technology, which is heating and cooling, mm -hmm. percussion technology, which is what you mentioned early on, the hypervolt vibration technology, our Viper, Hypersphere, et cetera, and then pneumatic compression, which are the Normatec boots that we just acquired that company in March of last year. So we're looking at all of those modalities. How can we manipulate the body? How can we manipulate the soft tissue to improve movement um, and improve longevity and health? And, uh, you know, I think we've unlocked a lot of research and science over the years on how these modalities cross over and you can actually use multiple modalities um, together to have an added impact. 
And um, the science is just beginning. There's a lot yeah. of studies that are coming out over the next couple of years that are going to be incredible um, in how products and technology can innovate to uh, create change in the human body. I love it. So what is the be- what would you say is the best modality combo that you have? Let's say I'm just, uh, you know, a fitness into fitness. I'm working out yep. maybe four or five times a day, but I want to make sure my workouts are really impactful. Like yeah. what, what's the best mo- uh, combination that you have? For that? Right now, one of the most popular combinations is the Normatec boots while having a Venom back on. Ooh. So this is getting really popular in the NBA. This is actually LeBron's, that's, that's his favorite thing to do. Like LeBron will sit in his Normatex and have a Venom back. So you're getting heat and vibration in the lower back. You're getting circulation and compression in the lower extremities and you get out of the chair after those two modalities and you feel incredibly flexible and ready to go. We're gonna go in depth on the Enneagram and the one who made it famous himself, Ian Morgan Cron. Ian is a best-selling author, speaker, and just an amazing voice in the space of finding your true self-awareness. The book, The Road Back to You, goes in depth on the Enneagram and all the different typologies that are involved in it. And on this episode, we're going to talk a lot about my sevenness, as you will see. And basically, I get a a self-help coaching session from Ian himself. It's, It's a thing of beauty. You'll have to listen to find that all out. But buckle up. Because Ian Morgan Cron is about to typology Enneagram you away. Here we go. Yeah, so the Enneagram is an ancient personality typing system that teaches there are nine basic personality styles in the world, one of which we gravitate toward and adopt in childhood as a way to cope, to protect ourselves, and to make our way in, in the world. Very importantly, uh, each type has a unconscious motivation that powerfully influences how that type habitually and predictably acts, thinks, and feels uh, from moment to moment. Love it. Let's just go through all the nine types then. So everybody has kind of a feeling of what those nine types are. Cool. So what I'm going to do is, is, uh, okay, no, that's always a manic episode. There's nine types. However, <laughs> uh, let's see if I can. Let me see if I can get this done in quick order. Okay. Yes. Uh, fire. So ones are called the improvers. Uh, they are meticulous, detail oriented, uh, and often morally heroic people who are motivated by a need to perfect themselves, others, mm. and the world, and everything that they do. Twos are called the helpers. Uh, These people are warm, they're supportive, they're kind, uh, they're generous. These are are people who very simply, if I were gonna put it in the most basic of terms, want to be liked. They're motivated by a need to be liked and appreciated. Threes are called the performers. Uh, These people are competitive, they're ambitious, they're goal-oriented, they're productivity-minded, and they're efficiency experts. These are people who have memorized David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. (laughs) Uh, They're motivated by a need to succeed, to appear successful to others, and to avoid failure at all costs. Fours uh, are called the romantics. Uh, Some people call them the unicorns of the Enneagram. We believe that there are probably fewer fours in the population than any other type, which absolutely delights fours. Um, Fours uh, are people who uh, believe that they have some kind of essential um, piece that's missing at their core, some kind of a fatal flaw. And therefore, they're motivated by a need to be special and unique in order to compensate for that missing piece. Fives are called the investigators. They are the most analytical, sometimes the most emotionally distant number on the Enneagram. These are folks who have a need to gather knowledge and information Uh, particularly about niche subjects in order to fend off feeling overwhelmed by what feels like a depleting world, you know, a draining world. Sixes are called the loyalists. We think there are more uh, sixes than any other type in the population. Uh, Sixes, loyal, steadfast, earthy, funny, practical, uh, good problem solvers. 
These are people who are motivated by a need to be safe, secure, and supported. Sevens, called the enthusiasts. You don't know any sevens, do you? I might know yeah. one. I might know one. <laughs> okay, I just want you to know that every time, if, I, if I'm speaking to 100 people or 10,000 people, every time I get to the sevens, all of the sevens in the room do what you just did. They start uh, waving their hands yes. and, and going, woohoo. They just, you know. Dang, I'm like everybody else. Shoot, I want to be, uh, be a four. Yeah, man, yeah. just for now. You don't, okay. you don't really want to be a four, trust okay. me. Okay. So sevens <laughs> uh, called the enthusiasts. Uh, these are people who are the joy bombs of the Enneagram. Energetic, charismatic, dynamic, uh, eternal optimists. Uh, people who are, you know, just bring so much juice and joy into the room that generally speaking, people are always happy to see a seven. However, they have a dark side like every other type. And for them, it's a need to avoid emotional and psychological uh, distress or painful feelings. Wow. Okay. Uh, eights are called the challengers, uh, larger than life, powerful, uh, confrontational and overly blunt. Uh, these are uh, people who have a need to assert strength and control over the environment and others in order to mask vulnerability. And then nines finally are called the peacemakers, uh, oftentimes called the sweethearts of the Enneagram. They're accommodating, easygoing, laid back, don't rock the boat, go with the flow kind of human beings who want to avoid conflict maintain connections with other people and often merge with the agendas and life programs of uh, another person or the group in service to uh, maintaining connection with them. So yeah. that's the, the nine types. And it's important to realize that within all nine types, there's an infinite variety of expressions of each of those types. So uh, that, that makes it possible for the whole planet to find their way into one of those silos. How does it help you grow in self-awareness? Well, self-awareness, I think, begins with self-knowledge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's really important that, that human beings know themselves. And what the Enneagram does in such an efficient and uncannily accurate way is explain to you why you uh, habitually act, think, and feel the way that you do, the operations of your personality. And when you are able to learn how to observe yourself in real time and begin to monitor and regulate how your personality is affecting other people, it begins to remove conflict, inefficiencies. It, it arouses uh, empathy, compassion for other people whose types you're beginning to know and understand. It, it really begins to give you insight uh, in a very accessible way, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful tool in that regard. And, you know, uh, I, I worry about how, for example, how many leaders clearly to me have no idea who they are or why they are the way they are. And, you know, they're just going through life as like an accident waiting to happen or a frequent accident that happens and they don't know why, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, why have I been married three times? You know what they say, or why, why have I, you know, been fired four times for the same job? You know, why am I being criticized for the same thing over and over and over and over again? You know, David and go. All right. So as you know, I am a nut for optimization. That's having your body and your mind at the highest level possible. So, I mean, I make a lot of protein smoothies and I make them taste really, really good, but I have to know it has the highest quality ingredients. I don't want any of all this other junk that everybody throws in that you see at GNC. And I have found that brand, New Zest. They're plant-based ingredients, the purest and most potent source of nutrition to give you a powerful, well-balanced mix of essential vitamins and minerals. I'm telling you, the creamy vanilla, the matcha flavor, I'll mix it into smoothies, into yogurt. Sometimes I'll just open up the package and drink it straight. It's that good. And it's that good for you. New Zest. So New Zest is giving listeners to this podcast, this Pivot and Go podcast, a special deal lucky for you. If you look at the link below and in the show notes, you will see it's Pivot 15. Pivot 15 will give you 15% off any purchase at New Zest. NewZest.com Pivot 15. 
get your protein powder upgraded. Pivot and go. We have B.J. Armstrong on the podcast. Now, B.J. Armstrong is famed of being one of the best point guards in NBA history with the Michael Jordan Bulls where they three-peated and just being one of the best overall leaders on the floor. But B.J. is so much more. As you'll find out from this podcast, he's a very deep thinker, outside-the-box thinker, and he brings a lot of mindsets that we can apply to our lives daily. Even has an answer about Michael Jordan that will blow your mind. I did not see that one coming. You will want to listen to find that one out. You are in for an absolute treat here with B.J. Armstrong, the NBA point guard phenom, the agent to NBA players, the entrepreneur, the podcast host, and so much more. So buckle up because here we go. More probably than any other part of, you know, working in the NBA and all the different facets that I've done, I, I love the... I love the rookies, mm-hmm. you know, more than anything, because you get a chance to see who they could be and the optimism that the players have in pre-draft, like you just mentioned, they have before they play their first game. There's so much optimism in the air and holding on to that optimism is a huge gift. And it's a little secret that not many players get a chance to hold on to because it gets so easily stripped, right? We all get skewed by our our everyday life or, well, you know, I've played and won so many games that you just think it becomes like common. But if you can hold on to that, you know, how you felt as a rookie, or you can hold on to the, the optimism that's in the air of like remembering what it was like to go through a pre draft experience, the longer you can hold on to that, you know, it just it's, it's a special thing. So um, I try to hold on to my my I don't know, my naivete, my innocence for as long as I could uh, when I came into the league, because I always wanted to have that experience of that wow experience when I first walked in the door. So uh, it's just a little secret that I think all the players who have an opportunity to have a career in this league learn that you know what you can't let anyone destroy your happiness you can't let anything Mm. get in the way of your you know wherever's your happy space you know that's your space you carve it out you hold on to it for as long as you can and if you're fortunate enough you can play this game for a long time and it could you know it could be a very rewarding experience in a lot of different ways right not just financially but spiritually emotionally the friends you make you know i'm sitting here talking to you watching you with your podcast and I never would have thought, you know, whatever, 10, 15 years ago when we first met that I would be sitting here doing this, but you see the growth in people. And um, so it's, it's, it's been a great experience for me. And if I could just have that opportunity to play in the NBA, that was my dream. That was my dream as a young kid from as long as I can remember. And really, I just carried that dream mm-hmm. and there wasn't anyone that was going to get in my way. And I just remember, no matter how many times I was going to fall down, I was going to always get back up. So if you say, what was my secret? Resilience. I was just, I was just a very persistent kid. Yep. Right? I yep. wasn't the strongest. I wasn't the fastest. I would love to tell you I had a secret drill that helped me <laughs> shoot. Well, I wish I could tell you I had a secret move. I was going to make this work. Like that, that, that's that's as simple as that. Yeah. And it's fascinating now to watch the game because the popularity of the game, every, you know, everyone is, plays now and it's a global game. And, you know, you have coaches, coaches like yourself. And when I walk into a gym, I walk into a gym and I see all these people, you know, doing moves and taking shots and everyone's getting coached. My formula was simple. Like, I was going to find a way. That's it. That is the secret sauce. I I, I didn't need a coach. I didn't need this, you know, and and it's not that I don't value coaching. I do value coaching. I mean, I've had the wonderful opportunity to play for Hall of Fame coaches. But the one thing that I value more than anything, and and I learned this from my dad, was my dad, when I was little, my dad wouldn't let me play organized sports. And I couldn't 
understand it then and 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 it's taken me to have kids myself to figure it out of why he didn't do that he said you know son i want you to know who you are before anyone else starts telling you who you are or mm -hmm. who you should be mm -hmm. so why don't you figure that out first and then when you figure that out i'll let you play organized sports Really Not because good. I don't want you to play with the other kids. It's just because you, sh before you can get coached, you should already know who you are. So I didn't play organized sports, Dave, until I was in high school. Wow. To like ninth, ninth grade. So my dad would encourage me to go to the playground, figure out what's your game? What can you do? <laughs> Call your own files. And while the other kids were playing organized sports my dad would just say go to the playground and play figure it out that's awesome just go go figure it out <clears throat> call you understand what moves you got understand you know if you lose on this court you might not get back on to you know two hours later so you know i i wanted to play like all my friends all my friends were playing but my dad was like because once somebody starts telling you what to do and who you are and you don't know, it can confuse you. Totally. So that's how I grew up. That's how I played I, and I played. And then once I got to high school, you know, I, I kind of had some idea. I didn't know who I was or who I was going to become, but I had an idea of what I could do because, you know, I just played in the streets. I just played in the playground. I, I literally... You know, my dad would come back and say, how many games you win today? You know, did you hold the court down? And those were my lessons. So my lessons were all in the city of Detroit playing wherever I could play. David and go. You are about to be inspired by one of the most driven, motivated people that I have ever had on this podcast or ever even heard about. His documentary, Seven Yards on Netflix, just came out. His name, Chris Norton. Now, Chris, he was a college football player in the great state of Iowa and broke his neck, his spinal cord, was told he would never be able to move anything, not walk, 3% chance of ever moving again. And he became on a mission, not allowing any negative thoughts to come in, flipping him for the positive, becoming so driven and having just all these, these, these interactions with people and just situations in his life that showed him, you know what, no matter what is thrown your way, God is going to use it for something good. And he is not just a survivor, but he is an absolute thriver where he goes around and he talks to companies, he talks to kids, he talks to people all over the world of how they can overcome any type of adversity. Because this guy, he couldn't, he, he couldn't even move. And then there he is at his wedding with his dream girl walking seven yards down the aisle. Get ready to get absolutely fired up. Grab grab the tissue. You might need it in this one. It's a little bit of a tearjerker too. Buckle up. Chris Norton, here we go. Yeah, I mean, I can remember being fired up and excited for to play football. And, you know, I've always wanted to strap on the pads and the helmet for another four years of college ball and i've been able to work my way up the depth chart i'm playing more than any freshman and so i just want to continue you know that momentum and earn my way to more playing time and so uh, central college very good at football uh they're they got the lead on us and in the halftime you know coach is mad and you know lots of fire under us and so you know we come out the third quarter we score a touchdown right away we got the fans into it and so I run out to the field for the kickoff, and the kicker, he huddles us up, and he calls the play, mortar kick right, which simply is a short, high-arching kick to the right side of the field. And I don't know why we didn't just call it kick right, because our <laughs> kicker was so bad, every kick was short and high-arching. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I'm pumped, because I play on the right side of the field. Again, like an opportunity to make a name for myself. So the ball's kicked, and I sprint down the field as hard as I can go, and I can see this opening for me. And my instincts tell me, that ball carrier, he's going to run through that gap. But I'm going to stop. I'm going to drive my shoulder so hard through his legs, he's going to drop the ball. And so I go for it. I collide with him at full speed, full force. But I miss time mm. my tackle just by a split second. Instead of getting my head in front of the ball carrier, my head 
collides right with his legs. In an instant, I just lose all feeling of movement from my neck down. Man. I can hear the collision of players above me, the whistle blows, the pile clears, but I can't get up. Now, I'm trying so hard to push off the ground, but nothing is working. And I'm telling myself, like, Chris, like, get up, like, come on, like, what is going on? But it just felt like someone just flipped the power off to my body. Mm. And so I can tell the game stopped for me. The defense is huddled out. They're ready to take the field. And I'm just embarrassed. I'm just like, I got to get up. Like, Chris, like, stand up. But little did I know, I just suffered a severe spinal cord injury. And, you know, it would take me many years before I'll ever find that, that strength to, to stand Wow, man, Chris, I can't even I, I can't even imagine that. So, and then, what was a percentage chance did you actually have to be able to move again? Because right in the flash of a man, millisecond, everything, all your hopes, goals, dreams, everything you poured into your life, I mean, it was taken away. Your control over anything was non-existent. And the percentage of being able to move, a, like move anything again, what what was it? Three percent chance 3%. to ever move or feel. Not a three wow. percent chance to walk. Three percent chance to move. Feel to move to, anything in your body. Yeah, wow. To, to scratch an itch on my face. To wow. uh, feed myself. Man, so when was the moment that I mean, you you had to feel bad for yourself, right? Was there? I mean, was there moments where you're just like, okay, it's all over? Like, what what was going through your mind in those first few nights in the hospital? Absolutely. At nighttime was the absolute worst. Yeah. Like, the room got quiet. It's dark. And my fears just came flooding out. Yeah. I had so many questions like, you know, will I ever go back to school? Will a girl ever want to be with me? Will I ever have a family and mm. be a dad? Will I ever be happy? And these questions would just repeat themselves in my head. I, I'd cry myself to sleep almost every night. And I couldn't even wipe the tears away from my eyes. Uh, it felt like I was trapped in my own body, like a prisoner in my own body. And every single time I tried to move and I couldn't, would just send me into this full blown panic attack. Oh. Like it was, it was awful. Chris, whoa, whoa, okay. So talk to us about the fourth night, the nurse from Wyoming. Tell us about. You had a funny quote in the, the documentary about nobody from Wyoming tells lies. Tell us about this nurse. Yeah. So again, I'm, it's about two a.m. Um, just really early in the morning, I can't sleep, I'm restless. And someone comes in and checks my vitals every two hours. And it's all very clinical, routine. They come check it, they leave. Well, this woman comes in to check my vitals, but she does something different. She comes over to my bedside, she gets down on one knee. She says, Chris, look me in the eyes. And she was kind of mean about it. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was pretty, very confrontational, I felt like. And then she's a short, slender woman, short reddish hair, glasses. And she's got this voice that sounded like she came straight out of a Western movie. And she says, my name is Georgia. I'm from Wyoming. Do you know anyone from Wyoming? And I say no. And I'm just thinking, where is this going? And she says... Well, people from Wyoming don't tell lies. And I want you to know, you will beat this. You will beat this. I break down crying on the spot. I needed to hear those words so badly. Because up to this point, you know, I was questioning whether all the time and effort I was putting in my recovery, like, would it ever pay off? Like, Am I wasting my time? Why keep going? And in this moment, it feels like my faith is restored and that it is worth it. And the thing about Georgia that I think is really impactful and for everyone to understand the difference is that she didn't just say, you can beat this. She said, you will mm. beat this. And I believe her. And just that changing and that word changing, uh, it can go a long way. And that just really impacted me in a way that just gave me so much hope. And I just kept pushing and pouring myself into my physical therapy, my occupational therapy. 
So the seven yards comes from our goal to walk down the aisle side by side. Mm -hmm. And so one of the viral moments that we had was uh, her walking me across my yeah. college graduation stage. And that went viral, like 300 million views. <laughs> and then so after that, we were like, wow, like people are really inspired. Like people are moved by this walk. And, you know, what if we did a walk you know, for a wedding? And so seven yards was three yards further than the graduation walk. It also represented seven years that I've been working and training to walk again. And so there, it's just so much significance in that, that seven. And so it was something that we committed to and we worked relentlessly again. And also, honestly, um, leading up to the walk, I couldn't even walk one step wow. when we first practiced wow. her walking with me at my hip. Uh, because when we're at the side, it's so much harder for me. I lose a lot of the support that I'm used to with her being in front of me. And so it was challenging. And in fact, what made it really scary too was People Magazine committed to covering the entire wedding. <laughs> and then an award-winning film company, a uh, documentary, one, they want to uh, do produce a life story, produce a documentary on my life story um, to show this, this walk. And they already named the movie Seven Yards. Like, there's no wiggle room in that title. And so I couldn't walk five. I had to walk seven. <laughs> David and go. Oh, oh, you know that feeling you get when you just wake up and you are not rested or recharged? Yeah, we all have it. We all go through it. How do I wake up with full energy every single day? It is literally the game changer itself. Chilly sleep. I have an Uller that goes underneath my mattress and cools my body temperature to the ideal temperature to get deep sleep, REM, high HRV scores. Now, I have mine pretty cold, about 57 degrees. The optimal level is between 57 and 65 degrees. I have a weighted blanket, which just cools my body, and I'm just sleeping in restorative sleep. So when I wake up in the morning, no matter how many hours I get, I am juiced up and ready to go. And lucky for you... You can wake up the same way. The people at Chili Sleep are giving you a discount, giving you a code. So go to chilitechnology.com forward slash pages forward slash David Nurse to get your special discount pricing there. Remember, that is chilitechnology.com forward slash pages forward slash David Nurse. Or just click the link below and it'll take you right there. It's sleep like a polar bear. Tonight, you can get the best night's sleep of your life. Chilly sleep. Go. This amazing guest that we have on today, he's a 20 years Navy SEAL. He is one of the top leaders, one of the top mindset coaches, and an amazing author. He's got this book out, Attributes. Phenomenal book. And it tells you about how it's not just about skill sets, but it's about the attributes that you have that are the separator. His name is Rich Davini. So Rich is going to teach us these Navy SEAL secrets, how to implement these tools of attributes into our lives and take ourselves to become optimal elite performers on a daily basis. So everybody, buckle up. Because Rich Davini is about to blow your mind on YouTube, on Spotify, on the podcast app, anywhere podcasts are found. Rich Davini, let's go. The way you determine whether or not it's a skill or an attribute is to ask uh, a question or two questions. That is, can I teach it or can it be taught? If the answer is yes, it's likely a skill. If the answer is no, it's likely an attribute. So, for example, David, you could say, well, Rich, I want to learn how to shoot a pistol and hit a target every time, right? Well, you and I could go out to a range, and in about two hours, I could teach you how to do that. That's a skill, all right? Or you could say, hey, Rich, I, I want to learn how to be more patient, okay? Well, I can't teach you how to be more patient. I can't, you know, that, that's mm -hmm. to, to, to develop your patience takes self-motivation, self-direction, and a willingness on your part to step into environments of uncertainty and discomfort so that you may test and develop your patience. You have to go find environments to test your patience. So when it comes to drive, and so I, I break drive down into five distinct attributes because yeah. overall drive is a combination of things. It's not just one thing. And so those attributes that contribute to drive, which are self-efficacy, open-mindedness, discipline, cunning, and narcissism, um, those can't be taught. Those show up. And now anyone, any one person can develop any one of those attributes if they choose to. 
but it's it's entirely up to them as to whether or not they choose to do it. So obviously there are some people who are born with high levels um, that contribute to the fact that they are driven automatically. They're just driven human beings. It's because they have high levels of this. But anybody who feels like they're not very driven can in fact develop it. It just takes their own their own fruition. Yeah, that's. I'm, I'm glad you said that too because I've been struggling with that. And another thing, struggling with helping to teach people, like can you teach killer instinct? Is there a formula to it? And you talk about 36 attributes in the book and how these can basically discern focus. And one of the things most people struggle from is being able to stay focused. And focused mm-hmm. in the storm, focused in when difficult times are happening, like you've been in so many with the Navy SEALs, like NBA players are on court when the pressure's on. What would you say, if you could pick a few of these 36 attributes, would be the most important that people can channel to be able to stay focused in the moment? Yeah. Well, so so just quick, the 36 came from what I originally did in the SEAL teams. In the book, I only talk about 25. Right. And it's, and it's right. important because 25, I wanted to make sure that they they spoke to this idea of optimal performance, which we'll talk about, I know. but um, And in those 25, I broke them into categories. So you have the grit ones, you have the ones that make up grit, the ones that make up drive, the ones that make yep. up uh, mental acuity, the ones that make up great leadership and great team ability. I would say for your question, with regard to your question of focus, it's the mental acuity attributes that contribute the largest to one's ability to focus because that really it speaks those those ones speak to how our how our brain processes the world um, and the information in the world so so you have situation awareness um, which is how much of the environment we are noticing okay our, our bodies t- our bodies um, take in about 11 million bits of information every second through all of our wow. five senses our frontal lobes can only process about 2500 right so so our, we're automatically deselecting a bunch without even knowing it. The the degree to which we notice that 2500 is our level of situation awareness. So some people are more vigilant and have higher levels of situation awareness than others, right? I'm someone who naturally is more vigilant. I always have been, obviously my career hyper <laughs> developed that. Um, <laughs> so I walk around the city streets and I notice like people's hands, people's faces. I notice cars coming the opposite direction. I notice signs, I notice dark alleys. I notice that stuff, right? Whereas other people walk around and they're in la la land, right? They don't notice anything. <laughs> now, there's no judgment, just the way it is. So that's the first thing: is how much we're intaking through situation awareness. Then there's compartmentalization, which speaks to this uh, this um, this activity where our brain um, first assesses the information, um, then prioritizes it, and then and then and then focuses on the top thing, right? So in other words, our brain is saying, okay, based on my current goal or objective. What about all this 2,500 bits matters, okay? And, that, and your brain basically comes up with a list and then say, okay, from that list, what is the mo- what are the, how do I prioritize? Nice. What's the most important thing? Okay, and then that top thing we focus on, right? So that's the ability to then focus. As you say, I'm gonna focus on that, on that and only that until such a time where the environment changes or something changes where I have to switch, which is now we are into task switching. How effectively and efficiently can we switch Focus uh, between focus points. Okay, um, some people, when it comes to task switching, are really good at focusing in on something, but it's very hard once they're focused in to pull out and 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 task switch. Right. So my wife is like this. She's yeah. she will as soon as she gets into a project. I mean, she just dives in head. O- I mean, head over heels like deep. Right. And and all, a lot of a lot of what's around her <laughs> falls away. Right. She doesn't yeah. notice, which is which is really phenomenal when you're trying to get something done. Other people task switch too much. They can't. It's hard for them to focus at all, right? Um, I would say you can train yourself because ideally you want to be able to focus enough so that you can pay attention for as long as you absolutely need to, either till completion or have a peripheral um, understanding of how the environment's changing, so that if something changes on the periphery, you know that you need to switch focus, right? Um, this would be like. Say you're, and I think I give this example in the book, you're, you're looking for a gate, you're, you're going to, towards a gate at the airport, right, and you're late for a flight, okay? You are focused on the gate numbers, right? So as you, as you look for this gate, that's your, that's your primary focus, focus is, to, is to find this gate you're looking for. And as you're running, you're aware of the announcements coming, and you hear over the announcements that your flight has been delayed, okay? Well, that means now you just, if, you, if you're able to keep a little bit of an awareness, now, now you can shift focus. You can come off that priority and, and switch something else. So that's kind of a, 
that's kind of a way you could practice that. And then the last one is learnability. How effectively are we able to process all this stuff, absorb it, and then execute it inside of our own systems? Um, how fast do we learn? How fast do we pick up stuff, right? And so, so again, admittedly, I'm actually lower on learnability. I've, I've, I've known this about myself, which means when I'm learning something, I have to repeat it a bunch of times. You know, I make the same mistake a couple times. Whereas other people we, we know, you tell them something once and they got it. <laughs> you know, they, they, can, they yeah. can absorb it and get it rapidly. So, so again, it's, it's not so much where you, there's no judgment on where we fall on this. It's just understanding where you are or where each one of us is so that we understand where we're going to have to put more effort. Just be thankful and grateful for all the things that you've already had because this guy is going to show you how to absolutely take that to another level. He changed my life. He changed my life in gift giving, the importance of gift giving in the giftology mindset. His name is John Rulin. So John is going to teach you about how, hey, it's not just about getting a Starbucks gift card or just telling somebody thank you or getting them a gift on Christmas, but how to actually use gift giving for your advantage to grow relationships, to pour into others without expecting anything in return and getting everything in return. So you can check this podcast out on YouTube. Spotify, the podcast app, anywhere podcasts are found. Check us out on YouTube. You'll be able to see John. You'll be able to connect with him even more. But he's going to blow your mind on gift giving. Get ready because you'll be able to fill the love tank of whoever your significant other is big time. Trust me, it worked for me. So everybody buckle up because here we go. Yeah, man. I mean, I, a lot of what I do with giftology was not to start. I grew up milking goats on a farm. <laughs> I wanted to get out of Dodge because I was poor and I was going to go be a doctor. But to pay for med school, I uh, started working for Time Warner Cable. I was climbing the ladders, and I fell off the ladder two different times. I should have gotten paralyzed, but I got lucky both times. Wow. And I was looking for a way to pay for med school, and I didn't want to go work at Gap or whatever else. <laughs> and so out of desperation, I uh, had a buddy who was a seminary student, and was the worst salesman on the planet, but he started selling Cutco knives. And I was like, if Steve Wiggers can do that, I can at least sh you know shift gears and try. And my fourth appointment of selling knives was my girlfriend's dad who was a rainmaker relationship builder and attorney and super generous and uh, I pitched him that idea of giving away knives to all of his clients because they're CEOs of companies and they're dudes they like the outdoors hunting fishing and uh, he changed my life forever he's like John I don't want to order the pocket knives that are like 200 bucks a piece I want to order the pairing knives and I was like what are you talking about you want to give a bunch of dude CEOs of big companies like a kitchen tool <laughs> And he, I said, why? And he said, John, the reason I have more referrals, access, deal flow, is I found out if you take care of the family, everything else takes care of itself. So I put med mm. school on hold. I started a gifting agency and started to teach people how to use, nobody cares about gifts, but everybody, you know, your, your wife does. But in business, most people aren't being like, oh, I got to get my gifting strategy right. But everybody cares about relationships. So that was the, the shift or the pivot for me was I went mm. from med school to um, becoming an entrepreneur. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. But uh, by the time I was a senior in college, out of two million reps that Cutco's worked with in seven years, we became their number one rep in the history of the company. How do you get that? How do you start making that process of getting the right gift for someone? Well, the bottom line is a gift. Most people give gifts that they like. If you like steak, you give steaks. If you give wine, you give wine. Mm -hmm. If you like golfing, you take people golfing because that you're shopping with your own eyes. But if you want to blow your wife away, you have to think like she does. And so a gift by its very nature, most people in Western culture make the gift about themselves, their colors, what they like on their, it's like, I've been in business 50 years, here's a gift. That, that's not about me. <laughs> the gift should be about them. And so if you want it to be a, an emotional gift, the gift should be all about the other person. And when you do that, plus add Seth Godin's concept of being a purple cow, so you go all in on personalizing it to them, and then you like make it unique and different than they've ever received. The reason the knives work is most people send Pro V1s or wine. If everybody did these thousand hour artifact mugs for everybody, it would just be marketing noise because everybody was doing it. But because so many people do the same jackets and planters and you know, the same you know, polo shirts and all the crap, then that's why like our first NBA client was the Orlando Magic. And they're like, John, everybody in the NBA does basketballs, jerseys, nets, the same stuff. You can only have so many basketballs. It's cool, but like you can only have so many. So like when we started doing the knives for the magic, Alex Martin's the CEO is like, everybody loves it because it includes their family. And I'm like, yeah, the inner circle. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm like, their family, their spouse, their kids, 
Like you include their assistant, you include their event planner, you include yeah. the chief of staff. Like anytime you can include the people around the person in a way that's a purple cow and you make it all about them. There's no logos on any of our gifts. It's their name, it's their family name, it's all about them. So if you want a gift to be amazing, take your own ego out of it. It's not about the coolest gift, it's about making the gift land and be something that, they, that honors them, that makes them feel seen, that makes them feel known. And even if your love language isn't gifts, like Gary Chapman, the five love languages guy, is a mentor of mine. And you know, God's wired us to be all five of those, by the way. Like yep. we have a primary and a secondary, but like if you like take and handwrite a note and then hand deliver it to somebody and it's an amazing gift that's all about them, and you're spending time with them, like you can take all of the love languages and weave it in and actually multiply the impact of the gift, because we all love to be, you know recognized and seen totally. and noticed and totally. and the, the cool thing about the tangible physical gift and really gifting and all of those is just love like the the knife the mug the whatever is just a delivery vehicle for love that's all it so is good. and what's cool about it being tangible is every time the knife is used every time the mug is used every time like hopefully daily there's a subconscious trigger psychologically that says that person knows me loves me and cares about me so you're the most top of mind person in that life because of the physical, visual element. That's the beauty of it. It's like a physical representation of love. It's not that they couldn't go buy it for themselves because you're not gonna buy something for Ed and Milet that he couldn't go buy for himself. Same with John Gordon. Yeah. Or really any, most, most people that are making six, seven, eight figures, but, it's, but when you put the story and the thoughtfulness and, the, and create this element of an experience with the tangible and you honor their spouse, that's why the Ooh. knives work. It's like Oof. everybody breaks bread in their home with a kitchen and food and drink. It's the hub of the house of every home on the planet is the kitchen. And so when you can weave in that, it becomes a story and a reminder of the relationship. And then now they're telling the story. It's like why giving a Rolex is so cool. Every time they look down, you know, Joel Marion is a great example. He sends like these Rolexes out to people. Every time the person looks at their wrist, they think, man, Joel loves me. Joel went way out of his way. He didn't give me a Timex. Now, not everybody can afford a Rolex, it's not, but it's like, wow, on my wrist is a physical representation of love. That's a powerful, that's a powerful Gosh. thing to have. And, and to be able to do that at scale, to be able to say like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love on and hit 100 cities of my most 100 or 200 or 500 most valuable relationships with a physical representation of love. Like nobody, like no Facebook ad's gonna compete with that. Baby, then go.